Dude, we are going to energize the country. We need to wake up and smell the coffee. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future is possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by Christopher Massey, a senior lecturer in history and politics at Teesside University, a councillor on Redcar and Cleveland Borough Council, and author of a new monograph published by Manchester University Press, The Modernisation of the Labour Party, 1979 to 97. Welcome to the podcast, Christopher. Thanks very much, Will. Um, So the first question that I'd like to ask is, what prompted you to decide to write this monograph? I think in general, I've always had an interest in Labour history. My PhD is on the Labour Party, but in a different period, actually, in the 1940s. Um, But I was very fortunate to uh, meet and work with um, a chap called Lord Tom Sawyer, because at Teesside University, Tom Sawyer was our university's councillor. Um, While I was employed at the university, um, or when I first got employment at the university a number of years ago, and meeting um, Tom Sawyer, um, it was said that, you know, he had a few papers that were um, knocking around his office that he could do with putting in a repository, in an archive, etc. And I got tasked with, can you go and have a look at what these papers might be? And when I had a look at the papers, I found out that there weren't a couple, there were 33 boxes of papers. <laughs> and within those papers were um, Tom Sawyer's um, unpublished uh, diary, which spans from pretty much the entire years of my book. So it begins in 82, my book begins in 79, and runs all the way through until 1998, kind of you know, the first year of labour in power, in essence. So that enabled me to have a unique source base to try and tackle um, this period of modernization from 1797, Labour's 18 years in the wilderness. And that was really kind of the spark of the project. And since I was tasked um, with working with Tom and by my employer. But then um, I think the first kind of um, instinct was there's not going to be all that much there. It's just, you know, he's our chance to so let's go and have a look and we'll take off any, take off him anything that's interesting. But what became apparent was that he basically collected every single piece of paper that he'd ever had um, throughout these years. And ultimately, it's kind of it's an insight that potentially no one else has ever had into those years because Tom played some significant roles in the late party. Um, and the focus of the um, monograph is very much on the organisational changes uh, that occurred um, in the Labour Party. And you make the distinction early on uh, in the monograph between the organisational changes and the changes in terms of um, presentation and in terms of policy. Why do you think the um, organisational changes haven't been uh, as investigated as March and them until you wrote this uh, monograph? I think it's potentially because kind of the other two elements that you've highlighted there that are in the monograph as like suggested this you know, three kind of pronged approach that people should have, in my opinion, towards organisation. Mm-hmm. But that the presentational changes were largely dealt with almost immediately by some of the key actors at the time who made them. So, for instance, Peter Mandelson laid claim to a number of those changes in the It's incredibly significant in changing Labour's image, branding, the red rose, all those kind of things. And I think that the policy changes are things that you know, most general historians or political academics are going to talk about because they're the kind of key shift that we see in the public domain. But to me, kind of the organisational modernisation has been left out of this and just for kind of listeners who are unaware of what I mean by that. By organisational modernisation, I mean the internal changes that the Labour Party has to go through in order for any of these presentation or policy changes to actually take place. The theme that Neil Kinnock inherits in 1983 is not one in which he can just do anything he wishes to change the Labour Party. He's firmly faced with you know, a left-wing leading executive committee, and he's faced with a conference that is you know, pretty much on the left too. You can't change anything immediately, and indeed it doesn't change anything until the mid-1980s, possibly, I would say, from the 1987 election on, which is when Labour's policy changes really start in earnest. With this kind of legwork that's done internally and by a number of different groups, that allows Labour, in my opinion, to uh, have the kind of majority to be able to modernise within the internal structures of the party. Um, now, uh, just to set the scene, uh, one of the things that you discuss at the uh, beginning is obviously um, starting 1979 when you know Labour just lost the general election against um, Margaret Thatcher and was seeing um, a dominance of the, the Labour left in terms of the internal structures. And you talk about um, uh, attempts for mandatory reselection and, uh, and an electoral college for the leadership election. And of course, mandatory uh, reselection was something that was um, on the horizon of the Labour Party not too long ago. Do you think that um, 
the left revisit these particular types of um, in, internal means of controlling the Labour Party because they're so effective? Or do you think it's because um, they can't come up with uh, another means of um, gaining uh, internal control? I think there's, there's probably two ways that we can look at that question. Uh, the first response that I would have is that, in essence, kind of the left used a very broad term, you know, the left mm. as a whole. I struggle to agree on exactly what should be put in place in the Labour Party in policy terms to make the party more left-wing, more socialist, whatever it may be. Um, they struggle to agree when they're in a room about X, Y, and Z. However, one thing that they could very easily agree on in the 1970s was mandatory reselection, because mm. kind of you know, spoke to all of their interests. Because throughout Labour's history, the parliamentary Labour Party, Labour's grouping of MPs has always been um, on the right, on Labour's right, not mm. on the ideological right, but on the Labour right. Um, and the only way that effectively you can change that is through having potentially a more open system of selection, meaning that Labour MPs have to fight every single time there's a general election for their seat in the localities and the constituencies. I think that's kind of a key driver um, potentially for us. And I think they continue to return to it, as you've said, because of the potential of that method having some effect. But in reality, I don't think mandatory reselection in the 1980s is anywhere near the panacea the left. I think it's going to be they remain firmly in a minority and throughout the period. Indeed, Tony Benn's challenge to Neil Kinnock um, for the leadership is an absolute disaster for the left. Um, and they don't really ever get that kind of significant parliamentary body. Indeed, under Jeremy Corbyn, even the left have you know, remained in the parliamentary party, a minority force under the Labour Party uh, leadership. Um, but I guess kind of in the internal structures of the party, again, in modern times, that's where we've seen the left rise more significantly. Mm. Uh, now, you mentioned, obviously, the changes that Neil Kinnock made in policy uh, after the 1987 election. One of the things that you do focus on in the monograph is Neil Kinnock's attempts to gain a, a stable majority um, on the NEC. Why do you think that that was so important for him? And how effective do you think he was in gaining that majority? I think I think Kinnock was incredibly effective in gaining the majority, but I think kind of also some of the work of the trade union uh, movement, the traditional right of the trade unions, you know, those things coalesce in essence, come together to form a majority for Kinnock. Because in essence, in very simple sense, in a very simple sense, uh, when Kinnock becomes leader in 1983, he's faced on the executive with a split of roughly about 15 people on the centre or on the right of the Labour Party, and about 14 people on the left. However, quickly, um, one chap on the NEC actually resigns. Uh, so Kinnock's actually in the minority for the first year of his leadership because the runner-up takes the place. Um, and that's a real problem for Kinnock because it means he can't push through any of this policy reform that he thinks, and he's spoken about quite openly, that he thinks is so needed in the Labour Party. So very famously, Neil Kinnock tries to implement one member, one vote in the party, which comes through under John Smith much later. But Kinnock's defeated in 1984 trying to push this through because he doesn't have these internal majorities. But I think Kinnock's kind of key work here, in essence, is, is his work with the soft left, which is where the chap I mentioned earlier on, Tom Sawyer, comes in. Um, Tom is one of a number of soft leftists who effectively split from the left and move up towards the centre. And in you know, Tom Sawyer's words, they become the first Kinnockites. Um, so there's a line between the soft left, the centre and the right to defeat the left. But it takes years. Um, I've done another um, article that's um, focusing particularly on uh, the split of the NEC. And uh, basically, I say it's not until about February 1986 that that split takes place. And it's almost too late in the electoral cycle to have much of an impact for the next general election. Hence, most of the policy changes come after 1987. Do you think that um, in terms of um, policy changes, because, of course, if we look at the 1987 election, Neil Kinnock was campaigning on things like... Um, uh, removing uh, Britain's nuclear ar arsenal, that kind of um, thing. Do you think that if Kinnock had perhaps been a bit more um, forward in terms of policy, that Labour may have gained more seats? Or do you think that it was always going to be, um, in, in, in terms of the, the minds of the people uh, in charge of the Labour Party at the time, that the 1987 election wasn't necessarily going to um, produce a, a majority? I know there was some um, speculation about potential for a home parliament but do you think that it, it was always in their minds that this is going to be a very slow and solitary process i think uh, kinnick's been quite strong on this in the sense that kinnick certainly when he spoke to me but i think he's also said this in a contemporary record many years ago 
that um, he had a goal of trying to win 40 seats or thereabouts for Labour in 1987, which wouldn't have got the party majority. Mm. Um, and he gets halfway there, in essence. And the places he gets kind of, the other 20 that he's not getting um, Labour into victory um, in those seats is there, there are areas where they only lose narrowly. So he said, on a good day, I might have got my 40, but mm. unfortunately it wasn't a sunny day kind of, it was a difficult day for the party. Um, and I think that's kind of, I don't think Labour were ever going to win that election, particularly with kind of, you know, the continued um, threat of the SDP taking kind of a good swathe of, and certainly votes, if not seats, at that election. Um, but Kinnick thought they could have done a little better, but not ever, you know, towards the extent of actually winning the election, threatening the outcome. Because I guess Labour aren't offering an awful lot different to what they're offering in 1983 and to the people on the centre and the right of the party. You know, the 1983 manifesto in the words of Gerald Kaufman, was the longest suicide note in history. Labour still have some of those left-wing qualities in the manifesto in 87. They've removed kind of the opposition to the right to buy. They've removed um, the idea of getting rid of the House of Lords from the manifesto with some of the more radical tinges that exist well on the left in the 87 manifesto. Mm, yeah, and uh, there was um, an attack, I think, used by Margaret Thatcher at the time, where she compared the Labour manifesto to an, an iceberg or something, you know, that there was a lot on top and then um, uh, other things lurking beneath. And obviously after the 1987 election, Neil Kinnock was able to um, achieve more in terms of not just um, policy changes through um, Labour listens, but also through um, more uh, structural change, which you discuss in uh, the monograph, the um, policy review. Why do you think that the policy review was so important? I think throughout these years of wilderness um, for the, the Labour Party, they need to prove, I guess, that they have changed. In 87, they struggled to do that. I think your reference there to the iceberg is a brilliant one. Um, it also kind of um, makes me think of um, a very famous Conservative Party poster of that um, election, which effectively had on the one side um, the Labour Party manifesto, on the other side on the poster was the Communist Party manifesto, mm. and said, kind of, you know, this is your new militant free Labour Party, in essence. Um, this they're, they're still very similar um, in the conservative view. But I think the policy review is key because it, it allows Labour to kind of have a long-running campaign that runs from basically 1987 through to 1992. If anything, it's a little too long. Um, that continually has Labour in the news that it is changing, its policies are changing. Um, as you suggest as well, they hold these Labour listens events, which um, allow kind of you know people who are not only Labour voters but the broader community to come together and say what needs to change in the party. And it's all about the shift, I guess, that kind of is talked about internally uh, between the likes of Mandelson, Philip Gould, etc., about making the Labour Party closer to the nation's media and voter. And they have, um, you know, Mandelson, Gould, etc., have this shadow communications agency, which is looking at this kind of polling data, which suggests that you know, policies such as nationalisation in the mid-1980s were popular with the public, so let's move away from them and as the Labour Party. Policies such as unilateral nuclear disarmament weren't popular with the public, so let's move away from them. And effectively, I think that's what the review does. It has kind of all these key areas that it wants to explore to make Labour more electable in the eyes of its leadership. Um, and the key thing that I hope that I've been able to do in the book to offer something different about the policy review, because a few people have covered this, particularly a number of journalists like Patrick Winter, I think, and Colin Hughes in particular, um, what I tried to showcase is how the policy review starts with Tom Sawyer. So I've returned to that name two or three times today. But Tom Sawyer, who was a National Executive Committee member in the Labour Party from 1983 all the way through until he becomes General Secretary of the Labour Party in 1994. Um, Tom Sawyer goes to Neil Kinnock basically with, uh, in Kinnock terms, um, a scaffolding, um, the scaffolding for change. And it's these suggestions about policy review groups that will be drawn from the trade union movement and the shadow cabinet working on you know, five, six, seven key policy issues, as it means seven. Um, and basically, Kinnock says, I just took Tom's idea and I ran with it and I made those policy review groups in these key policy areas to change Labour's policy. Um, and I was very surprised to see that on a, literally on a bit of paper, Tom had drawn these six, seven boxes and Kinnock basically you know, took the same bit of paper everything and said, yes, that's what, exactly what we're going to do. Um, intriguingly as well, Tom actually worked on that project with a guy called um, Adam, Adam Sharples, who very interestingly was in Ugly Rumours with Tony Blair, <laughs> uh, Tony Blair's famous guy. That is extraordinary. Um, following on um, from uh, the policy review, obviously we have um, the 1992 uh, election, which Labour again uh, failed to win. What do you think it was in terms of um, 
the public's perception of Labour that meant that they weren't able to uh, defeat John Major and form a government, because, of course, there's the famous exit poll, which suggests that there might be a, a hung parliament. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, and Labour is... I, I think Neil Kinnock once said that there were, like, 11,000 votes in it or something like that. Uh, and, and if those 11,000 votes had gone a different way in, in uh, certain constituencies, he would have become Prime Minister. What, what do you think is the central reason that Neil Kinnock wasn't able to become Prime Minister in 1992? I think probably a, a couple of different things. I think despite my opinion that like Neil Kinnock does a lot of the hard work in Labour's modernisation, I think his changes, coupled with a few John Smith Labour changes for the two years Smith's in charge, you know, give Blair a project that he, you know, give Blair a book that he can to go on top of. Mm. Um, Blair adds kind of presentation elements to this. Are great. And a lot of the policy work's been done by Kinnock and some of the organisational work too, as with Smith. But I think kind of unfortunately for Kinnock and the Labour Party in this period, Kinnock as a leader is never hugely popular. He doesn't poll all that well. Um, and I think that that kind of has quite a bearing on the election result. Another thing as well is that Labour run out of steam. So we talked about the policy review there, this you know, policy change process that existed between 87 and 92. And I hinted at the time to say problem was a little long. And I think the issue for Labour is that they've got all these policy changes that, you know, are getting headlines in 1988, 1989. Like Labour's shift from unilateral disarmament to multilateral disarmament for Britain's nuclear weapon um, is a major talking point, a major news point, but it's three years before the general election hits. The Labour's policies aren't getting talked about in the same way at the 92 process because, you know, it goes on so long, the policy review, because they don't expect the election to take place in 92. They think it's going to take place in 91. So for the last year of the policy review, they don't do anything. They just sit around and have a consolidation year just because they need to keep something rolling. Um, but it's a real problem that they've, they've kind of, they've gone out too early. They've put all their good stuff out there and there's less talking points as the election campaign. Potentially. Also, quite clearly, um, the change from Thatcher to Major um, allows the Conservative Party to regroup to an extent. Like on the day that Thatcher resigns, um, Kinnock tells his staff kind of, you know, celebrate today, but the hard work's going to have to start again tomorrow because we've just lost our great asset. Um, and that's kind of a big change, obviously, in the nation's um, history as well as the Conservative parties too, which makes you know, Kinnock now have to fight John Major. Um, and that becomes a more difficult fight and one that ultimately Labour and Kinnock are hard up to the task of being. Um, and of course, um Going from the 92 election and the policy review, I'd, I'd like to talk about one member, one vote now, which, of course, is very important in terms of um, changes in uh, the internal structure of the Labour Party. For those who aren't aware of its importance, why was one member, one vote so important? So, uh, traditionally in the Labour Party before, you know, I guess any modern members of the Labour Party or political parties in general um, would be used to kind of a one member, one vote system almost throughout most of the electoral structures. Um, but effectively years ago, most of the decisions in the Labour Party were made by their members, were made by a delegate structure. So what a delegate structure is, is where, for instance, so I'm in Middlesbrough now, Middlesbrough Labour Party would, amongst its couple of hundred members, you know, elect one, two, three delegates potentially to go and cast votes on behalf of the membership, which is the same in other constituency parties around the country at the time. One member, one vote is trying to bring in you know, single votes or single members um, on particular issues, particularly the leadership election issue at the time. And so it effectively will give more power potentially to the lay members. The reason potentially this is done is because it's assumed that the lay members of the Labour Party are less radical, less left-wing mm. than perhaps the activist members of the Labour Party. So these delegates tend to be the people who attend the most meetings, are clearly the most passionate about the cause, but also tend to be more on the left of the party. So it's thought by the likes of Neil Kinnock um, and John Smith. And indeed, even before those, the first people really talk about one member, one vote in the party are the Social Democrats before they quit um, in the very early 1980s. That if we give the ordinary lay member the vote, the you know everyday lay member, um, they'll be more on the centre, centre right of the party than if we give the delegate the vote, which um, will be tend to be on the left of the party. So that's kind of the steel behind why the changes needed to be made. And also, really, it's more democratic to have such a structure, and that's the overriding implication too. Um, now, of course, um, not only during this period did we see one member, one vote, but we also saw uh, the change to Clause 4, and this is something that Labour leaders for decades had um, thought about perhaps changing or attempted to change, and 
not been able to change. Why do you think Tony Blair was able to change Clause 4? I think a number of reasons, potentially, because obviously like Clause 4, for people who aren't aware, like if anyone is a Labour Party member, turn over the back of your membership card, that's Clause 4 on the back of it. But the words that are on the back of the Labour Party membership card are not the words that were there in 1918. They survived the first words from 1918 all the way through to 1995 when Blair changed the terms. And initially, it was clause effectively that was pushing for nationalisation, to secure for the workers by hand or by brain the full fruits of their industry. The clause now doesn't say an awful lot. You know, we achieve more together than we do alone. Um, it's more vague, it's more open. Um, the reason that Blair's able to do it when other leaders have struggled, so Hugh Gatesville tries to change this in the late 1950s, early 1960s, um, is because he's got a new mandate as a leader. Um, he's elected in 1994 on a massive majority, but also because he campaigns to change it very effectively. And the strange thing about this, which I hope I've been able to bring to light in the book, is that it's not a foregone conclusion that Blair's going to win this. It's often assumed that it's going to be a number of historians and academics that suggested that it is. But Blair gets quite a lot of opposition when he first proposes clause four. So the way he announces that there needs to be a change to Labour's clause, which has this nationalisation policy within it, he announced it at the Labour Party conference in 1994, his first leader speech. And he announces it without telling anybody in the hall really what he actually means. And spun afterwards by the likes of Alistair Campbell, it's fun to be what he meant when he said we need an up to date, um, we need an up to date piece of work on our aims and values or something he says in his speech. Um, what he means is clause for Alistair Campbell spins afterwards. The reason he doesn't just say on the platform, I'm going to change clause four is because he fears getting booed. He knows that for some in the left of the party, this is like taking Genesis out of the Bible. It is the fundamental tenet of Labour's existence. But he doesn't dare announce it. And you can see kind of why he goes the way he does, because I think it's three days later after he announces we're going to change clause four, after Blair's basically gone home for the week, um, there's a motion from local parties that's actually passed at the conference by a very narrow margin, like 51, 52, 48 ish. Um, it's passed to say we want to keep clause four. Um, it's, it's not a binding motion, Blair can return the next year and change it, but it shows that there is some opposition in the party, particularly amongst the left. So Blair at first kind of has this you know, vote against them straight away, three days after he announces it. Secondly, all the MEPs come out against this um, quite bizarrely. Blair goes to Brussels and goes mad with them. The MEPs write a letter in the Guardian which says that they don't want to change the clause for. Um, you also get a defend clause for campaign started by the likes of Arthur Gargill. So Blair returns to his staff in January 1995 and basically says the first couple of months of this campaign have been a disaster. We need to kind of get to it. We need to have a plan to change it. And the key thing that he does is he basically does a constituency tour where he goes around the constituencies in town halls, churches, and village halls, et cetera, et cetera, to say to local members, this is why I feel Clause 4 needs to be changed. Uh, because he wants to be the first Labour leader in its history to actually um, be able to put Clause 4 into practice. Because he says that no Labour leader has ever nationalised everything. Even at Labour's height in the 40s, they nationalised 20% of the British economy. So why would we have a clause that says within it that we're going to nationalise the means of distribution, production, exchange, etc. Um, that's his rationale for changing it. Eventually, he's, he's successful changes because he manages to get through to these local members who, who have said are deemed to be less potentially left wing um, than the average delegate, you know, good attender of the Labour Party, and he manages to get the clause through uh, because the constituencies back him. Um, intriguingly, a number of big unions don't back him, which is uh, then his kind of catalyst for change in the union party relationship. He reduces the union's vote to 50% of the conference because he's quite annoyed that unions that haven't balloted their members, in his opinion, so they haven't asked for that on a one member, one vote system, what do you think of clause four are the ones who are opposing it? But, um, a complicated thing, but it's so central in the Labour Party's history. Again, it's one of these things like mandate and reselection that we talked about earlier on that has come back around. There is a you know a clause four campaign now within the Labour Party from the left and the talk of Jeremy Corbyn might try and do something with Clause 4 in the bid, but there's certainly been this kind of move amongst the left to maybe return the old Clause 4 back in the Labour's constitution. It's a very current issue for the party because effectively it's about whether the party is, you know, left-wing, pro-nationalisation, whether it's more in the Blair model of kind of a, a centrist, democratic, socialist centrist um, party. 
Now, one of the things that I thought was um, quite interesting that you mentioned there was Blair going around the, um, the different constituencies and then attempt to convince people and um, to support Clause 4. Do you think that this is something that is always, regardless of who's going to be um, leader of uh, the Labour Party, something that is inherent in um, the Labour Party's structure, this need for the, the, the leadership to be seen on a constituency level, to be seen to be going around um, different constituencies and know that um, during the 2015 campaign, leadership campaign, one of the things that a lot of people praised Corbyn for was going around uh, different constituencies and perhaps being seen a bit more uh, than the other candidates. Do you think that this is something that, you know, will, will always be part of a, a, a leader's um, role in the Labour Party, perhaps in contrast to the Conservatives where the membership um, don't feel as um, perhaps vocal as they do in the Labour Party? I think I think it's crucial for the class four campaign. I think it's also crucial for Corbyn's kind of 2015 leadership campaign as well. Um, but I think you know party members like to feel engaged in the process. Um, so by kind of turning up to a town hall and have Tony Blair speak to you and tell you why he feels that you should come on his side, or have Jeremy Corbyn turn up at the town hall as he did um, at my local town hall actually um, in 2015 um, to say kind of you know this is the way I want to take the party. This is how the party should change. This is my vision. It makes people feel involved and included, and I think it makes members more likely potentially to back some of those changes. And even in the Blair era, you get kind of, although I think this does become a little tired in the era, at first it worked well. This issue called like delegatory democracy, which is basically where Blair, anything that he thinks is controversial, he thinks, right, I'm just going to vote out to the members. And usually because he's new leader, he's fresh, he's a mile ahead in the opinion polls, he's going to get backing for so he puts kind of this, it's, it's not a binding ballot, but he puts an entire ballot out to the constituency party members on clause four. and say, do you back my new change, yes or no? It's a very simple question. And then it overwhelmingly comes back as yes. Um, but then they actually change the Labour constitution to allow them to send such ballots out. So they send another one out, which is more binding on the parties. You know, do we like this manifesto? Do we like our new 1997 manifesto? Yes or no? Um, and it allows people, even though realistically, it's not consultation in any wide sense because you're not asking people what would you like to change or what would you add, what would you delete. You're just asking a yes or no question. It does make people think they're a part of the process a little more. And I think some of these kind of processes, including the town hall style that we talked about a little earlier, they do allow Labour leaders to you know, reach their constituents um, in a positive way because I think the, the Labour Party's local parties, its branches, its constituencies, district, et cetera, um, they're potentially more active than some of the Conservative associations which meet in the Conservative Party. Um, Labour are kind of a party of door knockers and leafleters. Um, and to keep people engaged, active and happy, then you need to have these engagement points with um, senior politicians, ideally prime ministers and leaders, but even like shadow cabinet members, um, you know, senior figures who you know, rally and round up the troops when you know, there's work to be done. Um, now, uh, the final um, organisational change that um, you discuss in uh, the monograph in the lead-up to the 97 election is partnership in power. Now, this may be um, a particular change that people aren't as familiar with in contrast to one member, one vote and um, clause four. For, for those who are familiar uh, with it, could you explain what it is? Yes, yeah, so basically this is kind of Blair's central organisational change to the Labour Party, but largely goes unnoticed, I think, in even academic histories of this period. Um, because most people who would write a book on these years, I guess, would be looking at, you know, Blair's policies, Blair's manifesto, Blair's successes between 97 and 2010, Blair's failures um, in those years, uh, 2007. Um, but the new Labour theories, whereas perhaps in power is kind of internal management of the party, and it's not really covered in any depth outside of, you know, my own book, and maybe like Lewis Minkin and Blair Supremacy looks in depth too. But what it's about is trying to change the internal structures of the party to um, you know, help manage the party. Um, so to be a cynic about this, you would say that it's trying to control the party. And if you were being more optimistic, it's trying to be a partnership between the party members and the party leadership. Um, so the main changes that are kind of in, introduced to this are uh, the National Executive Committee structure changes, um, which reduces the power of the trade unions to quite a, a large extent. So in the past, there were in the clinic era, there are 29 members of Labour's National Executive, of which 
the trade unions basically control about 18 of them, so they have an overwhelming majority. Um, and whereas in the Blair era, the national executive is increased in size and the trade union has increased to 32 members, and I think trade unions only come to about 13 of those 32. So they go from having over half to having less than a third. Still a very significant force in the party, but not the same. Um, the other thing that's changed as well is the party conference. I've already mentioned how, you know, in the Kirk era, the um, Labour Party uh, trade unions had 90% of the conference vote, whereas in the Blair era, that's cut down to 50 but the other key change to the conference is that they stop allowing, um, you know, a litany of motions on any old issue being uh, debated at the conference. They want to remove um, from the public arena this debate and this controversy, these splits maybe between the left and the center. Um, so they only allow a few contemporary motions to be debated every year. Um, this is very controversial because it's said to be potentially taking power away from some community activists. One thing it does as a positive though for those activists is it reintroduces the National Policy Forum um, to try and get policy debate taking place you know, somewhere in the Labour Party, but not on TV, uh, which is what the party conference obviously is. Um, so I think these changes are significant because they allow Blair you know, incredibly close control over the party's organs, et cetera. Uh, but they have been criticised by a couple of people that they've been you know, followed through with such alacrity that in essence, there's almost no opposition at party conferences. It's become almost like a democratic or republican rally in the United States. In the past, Labour Party conferences used to genuinely bun fight, be bun fights on TV, where you would see the position of the left versus the position of the centre in full colour uh, on the you know, television set, whereas now they tend to be um, things that people go to and clap um, a little more. Um, so that, these changes do that, and they've been criticised. That it's one of the areas in my book that I'm more critical of. I think that this change potentially just take it a little too far towards the elements. And indeed, some of the authors of partnership and power to gain include this employer figure I've mentioned a couple of times. Tom Sawyer thinks that potentially this went a little too far and did not achieve the genuine partnership we have hoped that the title comes from Tom. Partnership and power is the idea. Um, and it's not quite a partnership. Or if it is a partnership, it's one that you know the leadership has a very senior relationship in. Um, now, obviously, uh, the period that we have been discussing, the Labour Party were out of power for a protracted uh, amount of time. And at the moment, we're seeing the Labour Party out of power for a uh, very long time as well. And we've also seen uh, the election of a new leader uh, of the Labour Party. So um, what do you think in terms of um, organisational changes uh, Keir Starmer has to do to the Labour Party? Or do you think that he doesn't have to make too many um, organisational changes? changes to make uh, Labour more uh, ready for the next general election? I think that there are potentially two answers to the question. Uh, one I would have given 12 months ago and one I'll give now, but I'll try and give both. Because I think COVID's changed so much in British politics, indeed in world politics, that who knows about the next election now. Whereas I think uh, 12 months ago, it looked like Labour had the steepest mountain climb back to power that the party's had since pretty much the 1930s, to be honest after the McDonald's split. Um, so the compact we've made there is very apt. Labour between 79 and 97, the period of my book, lose four general elections in a row. Labour have recently lost four general elections in a row, but the difference this time around is that Labour in 2019 are further behind than at any point in the party's post-Second World War history. And it was Labour's worst result since 1935 in December last year. Um, that's a real problem for Labour, and it does require some quite big changes. Because Labour clearly don't want to think that we're back in 1979, 1983, in, as in the period of my book, and it's going to take us a decade or more to get back. So I think that Starmer's aware of this. Starmer has started some of this organisational change, and indeed he's been a lot you know, quicker about it, potentially, than some of the leaders in the 80s, such as Neil Kinnock. So Jeremy Corbyn, basically, between about 2017 and 2020, had a firm majority in the party's internal structures, particularly within the party's ruling National Executive Committee, which is the chief administrative authority of the party. Whereas the party conference technically um, is the top decision-making body. It only means once a year. We've already talked about how its powers have been somewhat neutered. The day-to-day -day running of the party runs through the National Executive Committee. Corbyn managed to get a pretty firm majority on that from about 2017 onwards, after he's elected leader for a second time and after the uh, 2017 result of the general election. Dharma, in about six months, was able to overturn Corbyn's majority on the National Executive Committee. We talked earlier on a little, it took Kinnock three years, four years to do the same thing. It only took Starmer a couple of months. 
He's been able to, by a switch in the shadow cabinet appointments that Corbyn made, he got rid of all of those and appointed his own people with the soft left. Um, he's also been able to have some success alongside, I guess, the centrist groups such as Labour First, Progress, etc., um, under the new branding now Labour to win. Uh, they've had some success in claiming back some of the constituency seat from the left the momentum against Labour Party democracy on the National Executive Committee. So he's almost managed to build a majority for some changes. The first key change we've seen, uh, which some people will be aware of this happening, but might not know the significance, Labour's top staff role is its general secretary, its chief executive, for what it's that term. And because of Starmer's changes to Labour's national executive, he got his choice to general secretary, a guy called David Evans, who was an assistant general secretary in the Blair period, and then used to run a, a company called the Campaign Company. David Evans is now Labour's general secretary. Starmer won by, I think, 16 votes to 13 at the executive to get that appointment through. If he hadn't have done those changes to the shadow cabinet post, and he hadn't have been successful in the constitutional section on the NEP, he hadn't have achieved this organisational change very quickly. There would have been a left-wing candidate for Labour's um, general secretary, I think, by Taylor off the top of my head, who would have won that post. And that didn't take place. And now Evans clearly is doing a lot of Starmer's work when it comes to um, you know, forbidding um, local parties from discussing the Corbyn issue, etc. At the moment, so you can see the impact potentially of having that figure in place uh, does. But I think the Starmer at the moment has only done the organisational change. We said that was the first thing Kinnock did, but if Starmer needs to rapidly change Labour because of everything that's going on, and um, he also needs to start working potentially on policy. Because if anyone looks at Keir Starmer's 10 pledges, which he got elected upon in April 2020, um, the 10 pledges look very, very similar to Labour's 2019 manifesto. Um, if, you know, a listener is thinking Labour's 2019 manifesto is one of the causes for Labour's defeat, Sam and White want to think about changing that. Um, if people think that it's not one of the causes for Labour, then maybe they can keep similar policies. Um, but Sam needs to change, I think, some elements of um, policy to get Labour back. He's done some of the organisational things, working on the presentational element of it. If you ever see Starmer speak, he has a lectern, it's a new leadership from the mm-hmm. election, but he's not doing the policy stuff. Um, but obviously, he's only a few months in. Um, you mentioned um, the uh, neutering of uh, the the NEC and the NEC. Um, in general, I'm interested in um, what you think is the public perception of the NEC, because I know that if you go back to the 1945 um, election, Winston Churchill was arguing that, oh, well, you couldn't elect uh, Labour to government because the NEC would, you know, um, pick a new leader and it would be Clement Attlee, it would be someone far more radical and all this sort of thing. And that wasn't particularly effective with um, the public. Do you think that the public have a real recognition of, of the NEC, fully understand what it is and the makeup of the NEC? Do you think that in any way influences whether someone will vote for Labour or not? I don't I don't think the general public have much of an idea about the NEC. I think, indeed, I think a number of Labour Party members probably don't have an idea about what the NEC does. Um, because it's one of these, I've said about the importance of organisational change, the NEC is one of those under-the-radar uh, bodies and, and performs under-the-radar functions sometimes. It's only when you get a very big issue that people talk about, certainly in the press, of what the NEC does or what the NEC is. So the issues about Corbyn's suspension brought the NEC back into the limelight because ultimately a sub panel of the NEC decided that Corbyn should be allowed back into Labour membership. Obviously, Starmer decided he shouldn't be allowed back into the Parliament and Labour Party itself. But the NEC made the initial decision. We've seen the NEC about whether Corbyn should be on the ballot um, all the way back in 2016 against Owen Smith. Um, all those decisions are kind of quite key. But for the most part, I would say that even I was, if you said to me, can you name all of Labour's National Executive Committee members? Now I'd struggle to get over half, I think, because most people don't know who these individuals are, um, particularly because the only direct appointments that the local, local members make in the Labour Party are for the constituency section, which isn't really that large. I think it has nine members in. Um, for the constituency section. So the majority of the NEC actually comes from other areas, such as the leaders' appointments, trade unions' appointments, and then there are kind of you know, individual members for things such as like uh, Labour's BAMP group, Labour's socialist societies, Labour have now a disability um, representative, a youth representative, et cetera, et cetera. So most people don't know who those are. Um, but I think that you know, the NEC plays a great um, role behind the scenes of you know, a very you know, prominent role in the Labour Party, but generally speaking, even its most committed activists won't know exactly what it does. It's come back into 
some form of um, understanding, I guess, amongst Labour members because of the fact that there's this factional divide in the party that has always seemed but has really come to the fore since, 19, uh, since 2015. So now any three elections are fought basically between a united left-wing slate, which includes momentum, campaign for Labour Party democracy and some other groups, and a right-wing slate, which is the progress Labour first one, both Labour to win. Um, and you're, you're on one of those sides or the other it appears in the Labour Party at the moment. So these things are fought in those ways now, which gives some people an idea that it's important, but I don't think anyone really knows what the NEC does, apart from when it makes the news about Jeremy Corbyn's suspension um, or Jeremy Corbyn's candidacy for the Labour leadership, etc. Well, coming towards um, the end of the podcast, it's been great to speak to you, Christopher. And I've got one final uh, question. Now, you mentioned uh, coronavirus a little bit uh, earlier, and I'm just wondering, given how much it has impacted our lives and um, limited our ability to do things, when the situation is resolved, as it hopefully will be um, soon with various uh, vaccines coming out, what one thing that you haven't been able to do because of the coronavirus, are you most looking forward to being able to do again? I think potentially, um, it's probably just seeing your, my family, I guess, to, to, uh, without seeing them outside somewhere. So kind of, um, like my father lives on his own. I do see my father at the moment, but we end up having to go to the park or something. Um, that's kind of, you know, to be able to just, you know, I would say that I used to, my father's a bit far away from me. I used to go to my father's house once or twice a week to have tea with him northern for dinner um, would happen all the time now that, that hasn't happened for nearly the best part of the year kind of um, that would be probably the, the one thing if i was trying to name something to be able to see those kind of friends and family groups that um, we've all um, been unable to see for quite a time well i think that's uh, something that hopefully you will be able uh to do soon and uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll be able to do it very soon hopefully if people want to find more about you and um, the book, where should they go? Um, so I'm on Twitter and my handle is C-M-M-A-S-S-D-Y, so C-M-Massey, so it's two M's. Um, and also kind of if you type in Christopher Massey on Google, uh, you'll find my staff profile at Teatside University. It tells you a little more about my research. Um, and my email is c.massey at teatside.ac.uk if anyone wants a direct contact line. Excellent. Well, thank you once again, for coming on the podcast, Christopher. No, thanks for your time, Will. It's been really appreciated. Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. If you've enjoyed it, you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, Podbeam, and Amazon Music. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Debated Podcast, like us on Facebook, Debated Podcast, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, whether about appearing on an episode of the podcast, or commenting on an episode that you've listened to, you can do so at the debated podcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.